Hello everyone and welcome to the videos on formulas with this being the first one in the series. This is a technical skills video on the topic of solving for a variable of interest. Uh, we are going to talk about uh, steps that we can take uh, to solve for a variable of interest in a formula uh, if, uh, if it appears only once throughout the formula. So we won't talk about cases where the variable appears multiple times in a formula. And also, in addition to that, uh, we have the condition that uh, the variable that we want to solve for is either being added, uh, subtracted, multiplied, or divided by. Or maybe it's made subject to a combination of these operations. Now, before we continue, let's talk about what it means uh, to solve for a variable of interest. Uh, so, uh, when, we, when we say solve for something, it means that you have to isolate that thing. And, uh, and as an example of that, if we say solve for x, uh, that means that we need to isolate x in the formula, which means at some point we have to arrive at a line that says x is equal to something, such as uh, x is equal to 1. Now, of course, uh, depending on what it is that you are solving for, uh, that entity has to be isolated. So if the problem said something like solve for x to the power of 3, solve for x cubed, then your last line would have to read x to the power of 3 is equal to something, or x cubed is equal to something. Or if, uh, if at some point someone says uh, solve for xy, uh, the product of xy, and uh, and that means that we have to isolate x, y. And uh, at some point, you have to have uh, a line that says x, y is equal to something. Now, I, I mention that because uh, often enough, I notice that uh, students, uh, sometimes when they solve a problem, they come across a line that says negative x is equal to something, uh, such as negative x is equal to 4. And, and then they stop there. Uh, and that doesn't work because... Uh, because uh, you haven't solved for x yet. Uh, what you've done right now is solve for negative x. Uh, you still have to take another step and solve this problem for x and come to something like x is equal to negative 4. And, uh, and the second situation where this happens is uh, when a student uh, solving a problem, they get to a line that says something like 1 over x is equal to something, such as 1 over x is equal to 1 half. And then again, they stop there. Uh, so again, notice that you have not solved for x yet. Uh, you have solved what you have here uh, is, is an equation that has been solved for 1 over x, not x. Uh, so basically, you are telling us what we get if we divide 1 by x. And that's not what we want. When we say solve for x, it means that uh, we want to know what x is equal to. So you still have to take one more step here uh, and solve the problem for x. Uh, x equals to 2, and then you can say that you have solved for x. Okay, so keep that in mind, please. Now, let's see if, uh, if these two conditions that we have on the side here, that uh, we will only be talking about uh, the cases when, when the variable of interest uh, appears once throughout the formula, uh, and also if it's being added, subtracted, multiplied by, divided by, or is made subject to a combination of these operations. Uh, let's see if this is, uh, this is limiting in, in, in some ways. Uh, of course, it is limiting, but we want to know uh, if uh, with these two conditions, we still can, can sort of tackle uh, a large number of problems. And what we notice is that uh, in the, uh, in, in at least in basic science uh, courses, uh, the formulas are not that complicated. And uh, many of these formulas are such that these two conditions will be satisfied. The second one, by the way, uh, we are going to extend this one uh, uh, somewhat uh, in this video towards the end. And we're going to allow uh, operations such as exponents, uh, roots, and logarithms. So we will extend that a bit. Uh, but still, we will limit it to the basic operations. Uh, so that would be addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, exponents, roots, and logarithms. Okay, so let's take a look at some of the formulas and see uh, how limiting these two conditions are. Uh, here's one formula, PV is equal to nRT. 
And you notice that, uh, for example, P appears only once throughout the formula. It's being multiplied by. So it, uh, if I'm solving for P, I should, I, I, the, the approach that we talked about in this video will work. Uh, v, volume, same thing. Uh, it appears only once in the formula. And it's also being multiplied by. N appears once. And it's being multiplied by. And same thing for R and T. So you can basically solve this uh, formula for any of the variables, uh, whether you want to solve for P or V or N, R or T. Both of these conditions are satisfied. Uh, next, we have uh, D equals D0 plus VT. And you notice that D appears only once. D0 appears only once. Same thing for V and T. And also, no matter which one you want to solve for, you notice that uh, it's either being added, subtracted, multiplied by, divided by. Uh, there are no exponents, no roots, uh, or uh, logarithms, or anything fancy like that. Uh, next, we have m1v1 equals m2v2. And you notice that this is the same. Uh, if I solve for m1, uh, if I aim to solve for m1, uh, then m1 appears once in the formula. And it's also being multiplied by. So the approaches that we talk about in this video will work uh, if you try to solve for M1. Same thing for V1, uh, M2, and V2. Uh, Q equals MC times T2 minus T1. Again, both of the conditions hold no matter what, which variable you want to solve for. Uh, every one of them appears only once throughout the formula, and uh, each one is either being added, subtracted, multiplied by, or divided by, or sometimes a combination of these. So for example, T1 is being subtracted. That's a direct operation on T1. And, uh, and the, uh, the factor that T1 is part of, that would be brackets, is being multiplied by. So that's what I mean by a combination of these operations. Okay, uh, next we have uh, A equals one half times bracket B1 plus B2 times H. And then we have M equals one over two to the power of N M zero. Now, in this case, uh, if I'm solving for M, both of the conditions here hold. M appears only once throughout the formula. And it also is being added, if you want to see it as a term. M0, same thing. It appears only once in the formula. And it is being multiplied by. The fraction before it, the division before it, multiplies by it. Uh, and uh, you notice that what we do have is 1 over 2 to the power of n. And then we multiply this by m1. M0. Uh, and so M0 is being multiplied by. So if I want to solve for M0, the approaches that I talk about in this video will work. But N is, uh, is not one of the, uh, it does not satisfy both of these conditions. It's true that N appears only once throughout the formula, but it's not being added, subtracted, multiplied by, divided by, uh, or made subject to a combination of these operations only. Uh, it is true that n is part of an entity uh, that's being divided by. That would be 2 to the power of n. Uh, but n itself is not being multiplied by or added. It's an exponent. Uh, and so uh, towards the end of the video, as I mentioned, uh, we will add the operations of uh, exponentiation, taking roots and logarithms uh, to this algorithm. So towards the end of the video, uh, we will be able to solve for n as well. Uh, but as it stands right now, uh, it doesn't satisfy both of the conditions. It actually does not satisfy the second condition. Okay, Pn is equal to 1 plus r to the power of n times p0. Uh, in this case, no matter what variable you want to solve, it appears once in the formula. But not all of them uh, satisfy the second condition. Pn and p0 are okay. Uh, you can think of the right side as bracket to the power of n, and then you multiply by p0. So p0 is being multiplied by, it appears only once throughout the formula, 
uh, and, uh, and the approaches that we will talk about uh, here will work uh, if we try to solve for P0. Now, if we try to solve for Pn, same thing. R and N uh, are a different story though. R, although it's being added, and that would be the direct operation that applies to R. But it's also part of an entity that would be the brackets that goes to an exponent. N is not being added, subtracted, multiplied by, or divided by. And it's not made subject to a combination of these operations. N is an exponent. So the approaches that we talk about here will not work if you try to solve for R or N. Although, again, towards the end of the video, we will allow uh, exponents, roots, and logarithms. And at that time, we will take up uh, the rearrangement of this formula for R or N as well. Uh, P equals SF over S minus F. And uh, if you try to solve for P, everything is fine. But S and F uh, sort of uh, fail to meet the first condition that they should appear only once throughout the formula. As you can see, S appears twice. And F appears twice as well. Now, when, when an unknown appears multiple times in a formula, uh, often you'll find that the formula is difficult to solve. Uh, there are some easy cases, like the case of P equals SF over S minus F is not that difficult to solve for S or F. Some regrouping is needed, uh, but if they are uh, different entities, uh, such as let's say the S at the top is S to the power of 2 and the S down here is let's say something like root S. Uh, then the problem uh, may not be as easy to solve. Uh, and of course, uh, these problems where there are multiple occurrences of the unknown uh, can become pretty complicated. Uh, the majority of, uh, of uh, problems in math that we don't know how to solve uh, involve these kinds of equations where the unknown appears multiple times in different forms. Uh, now, we will not talk about these cases in this video when the unknown appears multiple times. Then we have L2 minus L1 equals alpha L1 times T2 minus T1. If I'm solving for L2, then everything is fine. L2 appears once throughout the formula, uh, and it's being added. Uh, L1 is not, uh, so solving for L1 is not something that we will be talking about in this video because it appears twice. It appears once here and once here. Uh, Alpha, yeah, it does satisfy both conditions. It appears only once throughout the formula, and it's being multiplied by T2, same thing, and T1, same thing. Each one of them appears only once throughout the formula, and, uh, and directly, for example, T1 is being subtracted, and then indirectly, it's part of this factor, the brackets, that's being multiplied by. Okay, so this was uh, sort of like a collection of sample of uh, formulas in the sciences. And you notice how the majority of formulas in basic sciences are such that uh, the two conditions that we have here uh, are satisfied. So, uh, so at least when it comes to basic science, uh, these two conditions are not that limiting. All right, so we want to solve for a variable of interest in a formula. And uh, now the question is, how do we go about uh, doing that? Like, what steps do we have to take? And the answer is uh, that the steps, uh, these steps, there are two of them, and you repeat them until you're done. Step one, solve for the term that contains the unknown. Step two, solve for the factor that contains the unknown. So in step one, we isolate the term that contains the unknown. And once we've done that, then we isolate the factor that contains the unknown. Now we know what needs to be isolated in what sequence, but how do we go about isolating them? And uh, here you have, uh, well, broadly speaking, two options, uh, common two options that people follow. Uh, and these two options are number one, you can use 
natural semantics, which is what I recommend. Uh, this is the approach that says uh, you can turn the main operation on one side of the uh, formula into its inverse on the other side of the formula. So for example, addition by something on the left side can become subtraction by the same thing on the right side. Uh, and, uh, and the second uh, option that we have uh, is what I call standard semantics. And this is the one that says you can do the same thing to both sides of a formula or an equation. You can add equal amounts to both sides of a formula. You can multiply both sides by the same number and so on. Okay, uh, so let's, uh, let's take a look at uh, some examples now as to how we go about uh, taking these steps. So given a problem, uh, we'll uh, check the two conditions up here to make sure that uh, the variable that we want to solve uh, does satisfy these two conditions. Uh, then we will repeat these two steps over and over until we're done. Uh, I will be following natural semantics in this video for the reason that standard semantics is both uh, slow, uh, less efficient, and also less meaningful. Uh, but I will, from time to time, make a couple of comments about how it works, uh, so, so you know. All right, uh, so let's take a look at our first problem. Uh, problem number one says, solve the following formula for d0. And the formula is uh, d is equal to d0 plus vt. Uh, I would like to tell you about what this formula says. Uh, because to explain how we go about solving for uh, d0 or v or t in this formula, uh, it's, uh, it's sort of easier to explain what happens when we take certain, certain steps, uh, if we understand what the formula is trying to say. Okay, so let's take a look at uh, what's behind this formula. Basically, what we have is, uh, is a line, and uh, on this line, we pick a point, uh, that's where the observer uh, six. And then there is another point A and a point B at the end. Now the idea is that uh, an object is moving at a certain speed and we start timing it when it's at point A, it's moving away from us, and then at some point it gets to point B. And, uh, and the question is uh, how do we find the distance uh, between the object and the observer when it's at point B? We refer to the initial distance, that would be the distance from O to A. We refer to that as D0. And, uh, and the, uh, the distance that the object covers when it goes from A to B, if we know its speed and travel time, then we can compute that distance by multiplying speed and travel time. Uh, as an example of how that works, imagine that you're traveling at a speed of, let's say, 100 kilometers per hour, and you travel for two hours. To find out how far you traveled, you would multiply them, and you end up with uh, 100 times 2. Uh, so you cover 200 kilometers. So it's speed multiplied by time. Uh, that does make sense, because 100 kilometers per hour means you cover 100 kilometers in one hour. And of course, if you travel for two hours, then you cover 200 kilometers. So that would be your uh, VT. And we refer to the total distance from the observer all the way to B as D. So D here is the total distance that would be D in the formula on the left side. And then we have D0, which is the initial distance. And then we have vt, which is the distance that the object covers because it's moving. Okay, so the final distance, the total distance, is equal to the initial distance plus the distance that the object covers because it's moving. Now that uh, we are talking about uh, this formula that has a final uh, value and an initial value, such as final distance and initial distance. Uh, let's also briefly talk about notation. Uh, one way to talk about final and initial values is to use a subscript zero to refer to the initial value of a quantity and uh, use no subscript for the final value of a quantity. Anytime you see uh, the same quantity symbol uh, appearing twice, and uh, once it has a subscript zero, and once it doesn't have subscript zero. 
the one with the subscript is the initial value. The one without the subscript is the final value. Another notation that we use uh, to refer to initial and final values are subscripts 1 and 2. And we'll see some formulas like that uh, soon enough in this video. Uh, but in that case, the one with subscript 1 is the initial value. And the one with subscript 2 is the final value. All right, uh, so we want to solve the formula for D0, for the initial distance, for this piece. And, uh, and so uh, in order to do this, uh, we can use uh, a number of different, uh, well, two different uh, kinds of logic. Uh, one, as I mentioned, is natural semantics. And this one says that uh, if, uh, if you're solving for D0, keep in mind we want to solve for the term that contains the unknown, that would be D0. We have to get rid of all the other terms. Uh, and the other terms, well, there is only one of it, uh, that's uh, plus Vt. And you do notice that uh, I also included the plus. Uh, so it's not just Vt, but whether you're adding it or subtracting it. That would be the operation that sits on the left side of the term. And now uh, standard semantics, uh, or sorry, natural semantics, uh, says that if you're adding something on the left side of the uh, formula, you can move it to the right side of the formula and subtract it. Uh, so here we can take plus Vt over here and move it to the right side of the, of the formula. But instead of plus Vt, we put down minus Vt. So we get d0 is equal to, we put down what we have, d, and now we move add vt and turn it into subtract vt. All right, uh, if you take a look at what this means in the context of the word problem, uh, you notice how much it does make sense. So the first line says that the initial distance, d0, plus the distance that you cover because you're moving is equal to the final or total distance. The next line says that the initial distance is equal to the total distance minus the distance that you cover because you're moving. So d0 is equal to d minus v. And you notice how natural semantics sort of uh, follows uh, the kind of logic that we would normally use when we reason in everyday life problems. Uh, so basically, if the sum of two things is equal to the total, then one of them is equal to total minus the other. Uh, you can also think in terms of uh, forward and backward operations. So uh, the, the first line says if you start with d0 and then you add vt, then you end up with the final value that's d. So here we have it. We start with d0, then we add vt, and we get d. The next line says if you start with d, so now we start here, and then subtract vt, vt then you end up with d0, which is uh, basically what we would expect to happen. If we added vt to get to d, then we have to subtract vt to go back. Uh, so these, this is uh, another way to think about how the logic behind the natural semantics works. Okay, uh, so now uh, the other approach, uh, the other line of reasoning, uh, which is uh, standard semantics. Uh, says starting with d0 plus vt equals d. Well, you still have to know that you're solving for the term that contains the unknown, that would be d0. That part doesn't change. Uh, you still have to solve for the term that contains the unknown. It's how you do it that changes. Uh, so you still have to know that you're solving for this term, d0, and you still have to know that you have to get rid of plus vt. Uh, but this time, instead of taking plus vt and moving it to the right side and making it minus vt, to get rid of it on the left side, so we can isolate d0, we subtract vt from both sides of the equation. And so we get d0 plus vt minus vt is equal to d minus vt. And of course, on the left side, uh, plus vt minus vt cancels out, and we get d0. And on the right side, we get d minus vt. Now, the logic behind standard semantics, uh, usually an analogy with weights is used uh, to, to explain how we can go from, from the line uh, here, d0 plus vt equals d, uh, to the next one, 
where we subtract vt from both sides of the uh, of the formula and uh, and in this uh, analogy we use weights so on the left side we have d0 plus vt that would be these ones the equality means that we have balance that we have a balance uh, and on the right side we have d and of course if i want to isolate d0 I can remove VT from the left side, but to keep the balance, I have to remove VT from the right side as well. Uh, so that explains where the second line comes from. Uh, but in the context of the actual word problem, uh, this doesn't work as well. Uh, even in the context of masses, uh, natural semantics works better because just take a look at uh, how it sounds or listen to how it sounds uh, when I go from this line to this line. If the initial distance plus the distance that you cover is equal to the total distance. Then to find the initial distance, subtract the distance that you cover from both sides of the equation. Uh, normally we wouldn't reason like that, like uh, if I'm not using algebra. Uh, if I was going to go through this kind of reasoning and you said, yeah, this is what we have, uh, how do I find D0? I would say, well, take the total and subtract Vt from it. I wouldn't say subtract Vt from both sides of uh, what equation even. Uh, so, so that's why natural semantics is more meaningful. Uh, that's where the naming comes from as well. It's sort of the logic that you use sort of follows the natural way of reasoning, if you like. Um, with standard semantics, that's not the case. And also natural semantics is, uh, is more efficient. Uh, so we didn't have to bother with plus VT, minus VT, knowing very well that they're going to cancel out anyway. Uh, and we wrote uh, just D0 equals D minus VT. Uh, and uh, and so for these reasons, I will be following natural semantics uh, in, in all of the uh, problems that I present in these videos. Um, occasionally, I will make a comment about standard semantics, but uh, by and large, it will be natural semantics that I will be following. Uh, keep in mind that as formulas become more and more complicated, uh, natural semantics uh, continues to perform very well, uh, whereas standard semantics becomes more and more and more complicated. Okay, so we will be following uh, natural semantics. Uh, and uh, this may also be a good time to talk about the order of, uh, of the terms on the right side when you move plus VT over. Uh, because sometimes uh, students ask uh, whether it's okay to write down negative VT plus D. Uh, and uh, my answer to that is it depends. If you're just trying to solve a problem, uh, then you're not really thinking about what's, uh, what the problem is trying to say, uh, then there is no difference, of course. You can write down uh, d0 plus v, d minus vt on the right side, uh, or you can write down negative vt plus d. Either one is okay. So starting with d0 plus vt equals d in both cases. In what one case I put plus vt, I, in both cases plus vt became minus vt. Uh, but uh, in, in the top approach, we wrote minus Vt after D, and in the, in the second one, we wrote negative Vt then plus D. Uh, and the answer, again, is uh, if you're trying to solve a problem uh, without thinking about what's happening, that's all okay. Uh, but if you really seek meaning, uh, then the top one is much, much better. Uh, because look at how it sounds. It says the initial distance is equal to the total distance minus the distance that you covered because you're moving. The second one says the initial distance is equal to the negative of the distance that you covered because you're moving plus the total distance. Uh, it's a very convoluted, weird kind of, kind of uh, reasoning. Uh, again, the logic is correct. There is nothing wrong with it, but we normally reason like this. Start with the total, then subtract. Uh, rather than start with the negative of the of what whatever it is that you have lost, and then add the total. Okay, so going back to uh, the problem that we were trying to solve, uh, problem number one. Uh, the next step following natural semantics is to write down. Uh, now, one of the things that I would like to do, and I recommend that you do as well, is to uh, keep your unknown on the left side of the equality. Uh, this is a convention and it helps a lot because uh, the thing about convention is that uh, it makes communication easier. Uh, and so I usually, if the unknown is not on the left side, I either switch sides or in some way I bring the unknown to the left. Uh, in this case, switching sides works pretty well. And so I, uh, I put down d0 plus vt is equal to d. 
And now to solve for d0, we take vt and we move it over to the right side of the equation. So we get d0 equals d minus vt. All right, uh, let's move on to our second problem now. Uh, problem number two says solve the following formula for T. And uh, here we have capital T, which is temperature in kelvins uh, is equal to T0. And this is temperature in kelvins at which water freezes. And it's a constant value. Uh, its value is always 273.15 uh, plus temperature in degrees Celsius. So by convention, uh, temperature in kelvins is written using capital T and temperature in degrees Celsius is written using lowercase t. So this, uh, this formula tells us that if we want to find the temperature in kelvins, we have to add 273.15 to the temperature in degrees Celsius. And uh, in, in this problem, uh, we have two units of temperature, degrees Celsius and kelvins. In one of the future videos, I will talk about temperature in detail, but uh, in this video, I just want to tell you how you can make sense of the formula, the formula that relates the values of the two temperatures. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that one Kelvin has the same size as one degree Celsius. So if the temperature goes, the temperature goes up by, let's say, four degrees Celsius, you can say it went up by four Kelvins. It's only the zero on the two scales that are at different places, like here. Uh, the zero for kelvins is way below the zero for degrees Celsius. In fact, 273.15 units below the zero for degrees Celsius. Now, if you have the temperature in degrees Celsius, that would be the arrow going from zero to here. So if this is your temperature in degrees Celsius, then you can see that for kelvins, which is from here all the way to the top. We can say that temperature in kelvins is equal to 273.15, then plus t, lowercase t. And that's where the formula here comes from. All right, so we switch sides. t0 plus t is equal to uh, capital T. And now solving for t, it means that we have to move t0. We have to get rid of t0. And uh, we are solving for the term that contains the unknown. And that term only has t in it. Uh, now we have to uh, get rid of t0. But of course, we need to know what to do with it. Uh, on the other side, do we add it, subtract it, multiply it, or divide by it? Now the answer, of course, is that we will subtract it because it's being added on the left side. But the reason it's being added is not because of this addition. This addition applies to lowercase t. As far as t0 goes, the addition that goes with t0 comes before it. So it's right here. And if you say uh, add what, I would say, well, add 0, if you like. Yeah, and so it is this addition that turns into subtraction on the right side. And we write down uh, lowercase t is equal to capital T. And now we turn plus t0 here to minus t0 over on the side. Now, this is important because even if you had a minus here, so let me go back. There. Uh, if this was a minus, T0 would still be added. Uh, and that's what you have to pay attention to. Whether you're adding uh, a term or subtracting a term, uh, you have to look at the left side and see whether you have addition or subtraction. All right. So we get T is equal to capital T minus T0. OK, so to solve the, uh, the formula here for uh, lowercase t, I'm going to switch sides, bring the unknown to the left. And then we take plus t0 and we move it over and make it minus t0. So lowercase t is equal to, we keep what we have on the right side. And then plus t0 moves over, becomes minus t0.
All right, let's move on to our next problem. Now, in this next problem, we have uh, the formula d equals d0 plus vt with an additional term, 1 half at squared. Uh, this is the same as the formula that we saw earlier. Uh, final distance is equal to initial distance plus the distance that you cover because you're moving at a constant speed, by the way. Uh, the, the new term that you see here sort of deals with cases when you may speed up compared to your constant speed or slow down. If you speed up, then you cover more ground. In that case, 1 half at squared will be positive, and you will end up with uh, a greater distance. If you slow down compared to your speed here, if you slow down, then this term will become negative, and so you will be subtracting it, and you get less of a total distance at the end. Uh, all right, uh, now to solve for, uh, for d0, Uh, here I have switched sides, and there are three terms here. There is d0, there is vt, and there is one-half at squared. We are solving for the term that contains the unknown, that would be d0. And this means that we have to get rid of plus vt and plus one-half at squared. Because vt is being added, on the right side we will subtract it. So we put down what we have, d and then we subtract vt. And because 1 half at squared is being added on the left side, we subtract it on the right side, minus 1 half at squared. And that's pretty much it. Uh, once we have solved for the term that contains the unknown, that, that was step one, uh, we are done. So not always do you have to take both steps. Uh, sometimes uh, you take step one, and you're done. Uh, sometimes you don't have to take step one because it's already done uh, and you just take step two and then you're done. Uh, sometimes you have to take steps one and two and then sometimes you have to take both steps and then repeat them. Uh, so, so a lot of different scenarios here. Okay, going back to the problem that we are trying to solve here, uh, we switch sides. And then we put down d0 is equal to we keep what we have on the right side, then subtract vt, and then subtract 1 half at squared. All right, uh, let's move on to problem number four. Now, this one is uh, <clears throat> uh, d equals d0 plus vt, and this time we want to solve the formula for not v or t or any one uh, variable, but uh, we want to solve for the product vt. Uh, and that's this term over here. So we're going to switch sides. And then solving for vt means that d0 moves over. And of course, d0 is being added because there is a plus on its left. And so on the right side, it becomes a minus. We put down the term that contains the unknown, which is vt is equal to keep what we have on the right side, and then subtract the initial distance, d0. Okay, and we are done. Uh, you notice that uh, because the problem says solve for vt, we have to isolate vt, and so that's what we have done. Uh, and we can stop there now. Okay, now we have uh, the problem that says uh, solve the following formula, e2 minus e1 equals hf. And uh, in this case, uh, we, uh, we are solving for E2, by the way. Uh, and that means uh, we begin by solving for the term that contains the unknown. That would be there are two terms on the left side. E2 is one of them, and E1 is the other one. And so to solve for the term that contains E2, we have to get rid of the other term, which is uh, E1, and we are subtracting it. And because on the left side it's being subtracted, on the right side we will add it. So E2 becomes equal to E1 plus hf. And, uh, and you notice that it does make sense. Again, uh, you, can, you can sort of uh, justify this kind of a move based on the logic that says if the difference between two things, if a total uh, minus, uh, minus a piece is equal to another piece, then the total is equal to the sum of the pieces. Uh, so that's the kind of logic that justifies turning a subtraction on one side of, uh, of a formula to addition on the other side of the formula. 
Uh, now, one thing that you might have noticed is that uh, in, the, in the previous problem, or one of the previous problems, when I moved plus VT over to the right side, uh, I put D down what I had on the right side. I wrote it down, and then I, I put down minus VT. But in the case of the problem that we just did, uh, I, put, uh, I put what I moved first, and then I put down what I had on the right side. Uh, and if you're wondering why, again, that's all due to semantics. Because what I want to say here is that the initial distance is total distance minus the distance that I covered because I was moving. Uh, and what I want to say here is that the uh, final value, value of energy is equal to the initial value plus whatever was added to it. Uh, so so that because, of, uh, because that kind of uh, sort of order in which we talk about how things are being added or subtracted makes most sense, I write it down this way. So in the end, do you write what you move first or do you write it last? Uh, it all depends on what it is that you want to say. All right, uh, so for this problem, the unknown is already on left side, so I don't need to switch sides. Uh, and therefore, my next line says that uh, E2 is equal to, and again, because, uh, because I want to say that the final value is equal to the initial value plus whatever you added to it, I put down E1 and then plus HF. Okay, for the next problem, uh, again back to d equals d0 plus vt, uh, this time we want to solve for v. Uh, and, uh, and so, uh, now solving for v, uh, we're going to switch sides. And solving for v means we have to solve for the term that contains the unknown first. That would be this term, vt. So first we have to solve for vt, we have to isolate vt. Once we've done that, then we solve for the factor that contains the unknown, which is v. And uh, in order to solve for vt, uh, we, uh, we have to get rid of other terms, and that would be d0. And because d0 is being added due to what's on its left, uh, we move d0 to the right side, and we subtract it. So vt becomes equal to d, and then minus d0. Okay, so at this point now, uh, we argue that... Uh, we now have to solve for the factor that contains the unknown. We did take step number one. We solved for the term that contains the unknown. Now we solve for the factor that contains the unknown. And, uh, and the way we take this kind of a move is, uh, if you think about it, uh, we have to get rid of t now. There are two factors on the left. There is v and there is t. And uh, we have to get rid of t. Uh, but what's happening to t is that it is being multiplied by. Uh, so vt is a shorthand for v times t. And if I'm multiplying by t on the left side, then on the right side, I will divide by t. So it becomes d minus d0, whatever that subtraction will give me, and then divide it by t. Okay, so the next line is uh, v is equal to uh, d minus d0, and then we divide by t. Now, when it comes to division, uh, there are, uh, if you have to divide, uh, there are two ways of writing it then. And you should really know both of them because both of them are used pretty commonly. And, uh, and so it's good to know both. Uh, let's say that 2 times a value is equal to a total. Uh, so 2 times v is equal to t. Now this, uh, this formula has nothing to do with what we are solving here. Uh, so v here stands for some value and t stands for a total. So 2 times a value is equal to a total. Uh, from this point, we can, we can either say that uh, v is equal to t divided by 2, or we can say that v is equal to half of t. Uh, not, at, uh, not how the, the two of them sound uh, the same. Like in the end, you would expect to get the same thing, whether you divide t by 2 or whether you find half of t. Uh, it's, it's sort of expected that we will, uh, we will end up with the same uh, kind of value. And in an earlier video, I, will, I, I did talk uh, in detail about how it is that uh, when you say half of something, it turns into half times that thing. Uh, in fact, anytime you talk about a fraction of something, a percentage of something, or a decimal fraction of something, you can multiply the two of them. Uh, so on the left side here, we, uh, we have uh, t divided by 2, 
and over here we read it as half of t. And so it's important to be able to write your divisions in both ways. Again, because they're both common, sometimes this one is more uh, sort of a preferred kind of setup. Sometimes this may be a preferred way of setup. And so in this case, in the case of the problem we are working on, in addition to v is equal to d minus t0 divided by t, we can also write it down as v is equal to, and we put down 1 over t, that would be the same as your 1 half. And then we multiply by, uh, by the right side, which is d minus d0. That needs to be put inside brackets. So 1 over t will multiply the whole thing. Okay, uh, it's time to uh, move on to the next problem. And the next problem says that uh, we want to solve the following formula for t. Uh, again, back to the same formula, d equals d0 plus vt. Uh, so we would uh, switch sides and write down d0 plus vt is equal to d. And now again, solving for t means we have to solve for the term that contains the unknown first, which is vt. Uh, d0 moves over and it becomes minus d0. So vt is equal to d minus d0. Okay, so far it's been the same as, uh, as the previous problem when we solved for v. Uh, now solving for t, again we have to know what's happening to v and you might say well we are multiplying by it. Uh, but again you have to be careful about what multiplication you're referring to. Uh, so here we have vt is equal to d minus d0, and uh, if you are trying to solve for t, which is the factor, uh, we have to get rid of v. Uh, now it's true that v is, uh, uh, that t is being multiplied by, but keep in mind that this multiplication refers to t, not to v. The, the, the multiplication that goes with v is, uh, comes before it, so we have times v times t. And if you say what times v, I would say 1 times v. Uh, and so v is being multiplied by on the, on the left side. And that means that on the right side, we divide by it. And so here we go on to the line that says t is equal to d minus d0 divided by v. Keep in mind, you can also write it down as 1 over v times d minus d0 in brackets. Now, earlier... Uh, I mentioned that uh, you can think of a leading term such as d0 as 0 plus d0. And, uh, and the question is, how do you know whether you should think of it as plus or times? Uh, and the answer is, well, well, it depends on whether you're looking at terms or factors. If you're looking at terms, which is the things that you add and subtract, then you can think of the leading term as being plus t1. And that comes from 0 plus t1, of course. So that's addition by t1. Uh, you might say this is a positive sign. And my answer is you can look at it both ways. A uh, positive sign is sort of like a shorthand for the result of what you get when you add. And therefore, uh, if you have positive t1, that's a shorthand for 0. Uh, there we go. Uh, for 0 plus t1. Uh, and... Uh, and if it so happens that your leading term is a sub is, is negative, uh, so if you have something like negative t1 plus t2 minus t3, then you can think of the negative sign as subtraction. And if you say subtract uh, from what? I would say from zero. Uh, so again, you can think of the negative sign as a subtraction. It's addition that becomes subtraction and subtraction that becomes addition. Uh, so for terms, you think of uh, additions and subtractions. But if you're looking at factors, if your focus is on multiplications and divisions, uh, such as factor 1 times factor 2 times factor 3, then you think of factor 1 as being multiplied by, and it's being multiplied by 1. If you have uh, a more complica complicated kind of expression, such as f1 times f2 times f3 over f4 times f5, uh, then you should know that uh, if you're looking at f1 at the top, that it's still being multiplied by. There is 1 times f1 at the top. If you're focusing only on the divisor down here, not the whole expression, but just the divisor, you can say that f4 is being multiplied by as well. That's 1 times f4. But when it comes to the whole expression, not just focusing down here, 
then you should also know that any factor down here will eventually be divided by. Uh, so for example, this expression, if you're working it out on a calculator, let's say the f's were numbers, uh, you would uh, normally multiply the top, multiply the bottom, and then divide the top by the bottom. Uh, but there is another approach. You can say f1 times f2 times f3, then divide f4, and then divide f5. You notice that uh, in, a, uh, in a situation when you want to divide one thing into six parts, so let's say uh, one pi, and you want to divide it into six parts. Uh, what you would normally do is take the one pi divided into two parts, and then you would divide uh, each half into three parts. So dividing one into six parts is the same as dividing one into two parts, and then uh, taking the result and dividing it into, into three parts. Okay, so if the focus is on terms, then we think of the expression to begin with either 0 plus or 0 minus. If the focus is on factors, then we think of the leading expression uh, or the leading factor as being uh, starting with 1 times or 1 divided by. Although technically in this case you wouldn't call this a factor. Uh, factors are things that you multiply by. Uh, but we're talking about factors on the top and the bottom. Uh, of, a, of a division. As, but, but there is a shorthand, like uh, in the case of 0 plus t1, uh, we sort of, as everybody knows, we don't really write the 0, we just put down positive or negative. And in the case of positive, we don't even bother with that, so we just write down t1. Uh, in the case of, uh, of factors, uh, for multiplication, 1 is not written down, and uh, the times is not written down, so we just say f1. Uh, if it's division, though, uh, both the 1 and the division sign uh, are written down. Uh, to be honest, you don't have to write the 1 down. Uh, I don't know why they kept it. Uh, just like uh, with the negative, where you have uh, a negative t1 means 0 minus t1. You could think of divide by f1 as being 1 divided by f1. But it's kept already uh, anyway. And, uh, and so, uh, so we keep it now. Uh, we keep it too. Uh, but keep in mind that these expressions, we don't really use the double dot notation in the sciences. As you can see, for division, we use the horizontal line. Uh, and so the top expression would have been written as just uh, 1 times f1 over f2, and the 1 times would have been dropped to just uh, f1 over f2. And in the case of the second expression, uh, we would write it down as 1 times f2, and then notice that f1 is being divided by, and so it appears down here. And the 1 times would be dropped again, and uh, we would end up with, uh, with f2 over f1. Okay, it's time to move on to the next problem. And the next one says, solve the following formula for v. Okay, we switch sides. Now, there are three terms on the left d0, vt, 1 half at squared. We solve for the term that contains the unknown. So we keep vt is equal to, we put down what we have on the, on the right side, that's d, and then we take the term d0, which is being added, going to the uh, addition sign on its left, and we move it to the right side, and we make that a subtraction. And we do the same with plus 1 half at squared. Now at this stage we solve for the factor that contains the unknown. And if we are solving for v, we turn multiplication by t into division by t on the right side. Keep in mind that this can be written down in two ways. Either as division by t, or we can write it down as 1 over t multiplied by the right side. The right side should be in brackets again. Okay, on to the next problem. Uh, solve the following formula for S. And uh, just to give you some context, uh, this is a formula for the uh, perimeter of an isosceles uh, triangle. Uh, so let's say that, uh, that we have uh, in this triangle that the equal sides have length S and the bottom has length B. Uh, 
and so the perimeter which is the total length around this triangle uh, would be equal to 2s that would be the two sides here uh, plus the base and we want to solve this for s okay so what we do is we uh, switch sides we put down 2s plus b is equal to p and now we solve for the term that contains the unknown that would be 2s and to solve for this term to isolate it we take plus b and move it over and make it minus b so 2s becomes equal to p and then we subtract b okay so it says that the uh, the two sides the length of the two sides is the total minus b which does make sense as you can tell uh, now to find the length of one side we have to divide by 2 so we take p minus b and divide by 2 or we can say that the length of one of the sides one of the equal sides is equal to half of the difference between p and b okay let's move on to the next problem now problem number 10 uh, says that uh, we want to solve the formula f equals ma for a and uh, in this case uh, step one doesn't need to be taken because if you think about it the term that contains the unknown is already solved after we switch sides there is only one term on the left side and that's already uh, isolated so we don't have to do step one we move on to step number two and solve for the factor that contains the unknown there are two factors m and a and if you're solving for a m which is being multiplied by because it's one times m uh, turns into division on the right side and we end up with a is equal to f over m problem 11 m1 v1 is equal to m2 v2 and we want to solve for m1 and, uh, and so uh, the unknown is already on the left side, so I'm not going to switch sides. Because V1 is being multiplied by on the left, we divide by it on the right side. So M1 becomes equal to M2 V2 divided by V1. Now we can also write it down as V2 over V1 times M2. Now the advantage of, uh, of the second one, which is the preferred way to write it down, but it comes with some experience uh, to know that this is a better way of writing it down. The advantage is that it shows that the relationship between the two masses is, uh, is through a factor of, uh, of speeds. Uh, so that's one reason why we prefer the second kind of setup. All right, uh, next we have uh, lambda is equal to h over mv and uh, and in order to solve for h uh, we switch sides and then because mv is being divided by on the right side we multiply multiply by it. remember i just mentioned that if you're dividing by a product you're dividing by each factor so you are dividing by m and you are dividing by v and on the right side we multiply by m and we multiply by v and we end up with h is equal to lambda mv. Problem 13, uh, we want to solve this formula, uh, this time for v. And, uh, and now here, what we can do is we can say because we are dividing by v on this side, we can move it up and multiply on the other side. So we get lambda v. And then to isolate v, we need to take lambda, which we are multiplying by here and move it down so factors can move diagonally in that way uh, we start with lambda equals h over mv and v becomes equal to h over m lambda returning by the way uh, to this formula m1 v1 equals m2 v2 keep in mind that we can solve for m2 v2 v1 in the same way if you're solving for m2 uh, you're multiplying by v2 here, so you can move it down and divide by it.
Okay, so solve the following formula for V, and uh, if you solve for M, it would be the same story, by the way. For V, what we do is uh, move V diagonally up, uh, so division by V becomes multiplication by V on the left side, and then we move lambda diagonally down. Uh, multiplication by lambda on the left becomes division by lambda on the right side. And for M, we would also do the same thing. Okay, so the solution for V, H over m uh, lambda m and if you were solving for m instead then m would have been here where v is and v would have been where m is okay so this formula again uh, well uh, this version of it where we have the ratio of the initial and final values of two quantities and we want to solve for uh, p1 p2 n1 or n2 this is a very very common kind of a formula uh, where you have two quantities with initial and final values, like P1, P2 being the initial and final values of the first quantity pressure, and uh, N1 and N2 being the initial and final values of the uh, uh, of the second quantity, which is amount. Uh, and, uh, and so this kind of setup is pretty common. And so the good news is if you know how to do uh, how to solve for uh, for one formula like this for the unknowns in this formula. Uh, for any other formula that uses other kinds of variables, you can use the same kind of setup and approach. Solving for P1, because P2 is dividing it on the left side, on the right side it will multiply. So we get N1, P2 moves up, becomes multiplication, and then divide by N2. Uh, a better approach would be to write it down as N1 over N2 times P2. And the reason for that is because it sort of shows that the pressures are related, the initial and final values of pressure are related through multiplication by the ratio of the amounts. Uh, now, knowing that this is a better way of writing it, to be honest, it comes from a bit of experience with these formulas. Uh, but again, keep in mind, because this form appears frequently enough, uh, you will come across these kinds of setups, and it's best to know that this is a better way of writing it there. Solving for P2. Uh, now here what we do is uh, we start with uh, by moving P2 diagonally up. So we take P2 from here and move it up here. On the left side, uh, we, also, we have uh, P1 of course to begin with and then we take N2 and move it up. So if P2 is moving to the right side, N1 and N2 have to move out of the way. N2 moves up and N1 moves down. Okay, now uh, you can switch sides and keep your unknown on the left side. Or if you practice a bit, after a while you'll notice that uh, the middle line, uh, you can slowly, slowly, slowly let it fade away and just write P2 equals P1 N2 over N1. Let's see that again. Slowly, slowly slowly fade away so if you can do that that would be wonderful uh, and uh, by the way in case you don't like this kind of approach uh, there is an alternative uh, it's called the crisscross technique uh, basically you multiply along the diagonal here and you put down p1 n2 is equal to and then you multiply along the other diagonal and you put down P2 and 1. Uh, this approach works. Uh, basically what's happening is that you're turning division by P2 on the left to multiplication by P2 on the right. And you're turning division by N2 on the left to multiplication by N2 on the right side. And then you can divide by whatever you want to get rid of. So P1, N2 over N1. Uh, this approach works as well, although it's uh, sort of slower. <clears throat> Uh, and uh, and the uh, the reason for it is because the n one which which we have to get rid of uh, was not moved at the same time uh, in one step. Uh, we sort of took our took our time and uh, put down the intermediate step. Uh, it's a good approach to know for one. Uh, many many people use this approach, and uh, and for two, uh, it's good to know different approaches anyway. Uh, 
again, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the more approaches you know, the better for you. The more connections you make, uh, the more things make sense for you. Okay, so here I'll take the shortcut. I'll put down P2. I assume that I've moved P2 diagonally up, but I'm going to write it on the left side. And then on, uh, up here, on the left side, I would get P1 times N2 divided by N1. And I write that down next. Okay, a better approach would be to write down, again, uh, keep the ratios of, of Ns and then multiply by P. Okay, if you choose to take this route, uh, then it would be nice to also switch sides at the end and keep the unknown on the left. Okay, now we have to solve, uh, we want to solve this formula for N1. And uh, in this case, division by N2 will turn into multiplication by N2 on the left. But I will put N, N1 down uh, first. So I put down N1 equals, and then if you keep N1 in mind, it's at the top. Now N2 moves diagonally up, you get P1 N2, and then divide by P2. Uh, a better way of writing it down, ratio of pressures, multiplied by the amount. And keep in mind, if this, uh, if this uh, confuses you in any way, you can always do a crisscross. But this is much, much better. Uh, this works as well if, uh, if the expression on the right side is complicated. Okay, and uh, solving this same formula for uh, N2, we put down N2 is equal to, now imagine that N2 has moved diagonally up, and now P1 has to move down, P2 has to move up. So we get P2N1 over P1. Solve the following formula for delta E. Uh, we switch sides. <coughs> And then division by delta t becomes multiplication by delta t on the right side. Okay. Problem 19. Uh, solve the following formula for b. Now this is an interesting formula, the area of a triangle. Uh, and, uh, and again, uh, from time to time, it's a good idea to talk about where formulas come from. And in this formula, uh, to find the area of a triangle uh, with base B, so that's the length of this piece down here, and uh, let's say that it has a height of H. Now, uh, imagine a rectangle that sort of covers that triangle. And let's for a moment, uh, and it has length, uh, a length and a width. And uh, if we focus on the, on the rectangle for a minute uh, and write its area, uh, the area becomes length times width, so LW. Now if we uh, take our focus back to the triangle again, and actually before we do that, uh, you notice that because L is the same as B, and W is the same as H, we can replace L and W with B and H, and that gives us area is equal to BH. That's for the rectangle. Now, if we focus back on the triangle, uh, then for the triangle, uh, you notice that the area of the triangle is exactly half of the area of the rectangle, uh, because these two triangles are have the same size, and so, the, so do these two. And so the area of the, area of the triangle is half of the area of that rectangle. Uh, and because the area of the rectangle is B times H, that's the length times width, the area of the triangle becomes half of that. And remember, half of, we write it down as half times. So area becomes one half times B times H. Okay, so to solve for, uh, for, the, uh, for the base, we switch sides, bring the unknown to the left. Uh, and now uh, step one doesn't need to be uh, taken because the term that contains the unknown is already uh, solved for. Uh, we look for the factor that contains the unknown. And uh, by factor here, uh, we mean uh, if you have a division, 
uh, factors in the divisor and also dividend, uh, we look at those as separate. Uh, so there is 1, 2, B, and H. We are solving for the factor that contains the unknown, that would be B. And because 2 is dividing it on the left side, keep in mind half of BH could be written down as BH divided by 2. Uh, B, is, B becomes equal to, we keep A, we multiply by 2, so division by 2 on the left becomes multiplication by 2 on the right. And down here we should put down 1H, and we don't write the 1 down, so just H. Uh, two things about the use of actual numbers in a formula. One is that uh, if there are actual values, actual numerical values, uh, these ones are, uh, are uh, and, and the discussion is theoretical. Uh, these values are exact. Like in this case, when we say the triangle has half the area of the rectangle, we're not talking about almost half of it. Uh, it's exactly half of it. Uh, and, uh, and the second thing is that uh, you can also think of this, again, as instead of half of BH, as BH divided by 2. Okay, the next problem, uh, radiation problem. And this problem says that m is equal to 1 over 2 to the power of n times m0. Uh, we are solving for m0. Let's switch sides. Okay, now there is only one term on the left. So step 1 doesn't have to be taken. We move on to factors that uh, we solve for the factor that contains the unknown. And again, for division, we see the top factors as different from the bottom ones. Uh, there, there is uh, 1, there is 2 to the power of n, and there is m0. Uh, because 2 to the power of n is dividing on the left, it will uh, multiply on the right side. E is equal to mc squared, and we are solving not for c, but c squared. So you could solve for a factor that's uh, complicated. Uh, we switch sides. Uh, now there are two, there is one term on the left, so we don't have to take step number one. Uh, there are two factors. M is one, and C squared is the other one. We are solving for the factor that contains C squared. Multiplication by M becomes division on the right side. Now here we have v is equal to d minus d0 over t minus t0, and this setup is also pretty common. Uh, so there is one, for example, for acceleration, a is equal to v minus v0 over t minus t0. There is one for power, how quickly you use energy, and p becomes equal to e minus e0 over t minus t0. So this kind of setup is common enough, and again, if you know how to solve for one of these unknowns, then you know how to solve for... Uh, the, same un, uh, the same unknown uh, in, in a formula that's similar to it. <clears throat> okay, here we want to solve for D. And uh, we switch sides. Now, in this case, uh, we have uh, one term on the left side. So, step one doesn't need to be taken. And because we have division, uh, we think of the factors on, on, the, on the top, which is the dividend, and the factors down, which is the divisor, as separate. On the top, when we look, we don't see factors, and we need factors. So you can, in your, uh, in your mind's eye, you can put the, whole, put the whole thing in brackets and think of it as one factor. Same thing down here, t minus t0, you can put the whole thing in your mind's eye in brackets and see it as one factor. And so solving for the factor that contains the unknown, that would be the top, we take division by t minus t0 and turn it into multiplication on the right side. And now solving for d, minus d0, subtraction by d0, moves over, becomes plus. You notice that uh, we solved for the factor on the top that contains the unknown, that was d minus d0, and, uh, and now uh, we are solving for the term that contains the unknown, so we are repeating step 1 now. Uh, and, uh, and subtraction by d0 becomes addition by d0 on the right side. Same problem, this time we want to solve for t0. Uh, and, uh, and so this time, instead of switching sides, I'll take division by t minus t0 and turn it into multiplication on the left, and I'll take uh, v 
which is multiplying t minus t0, uh, well, it's being multiplied by because you have 1 times v moves down and becomes uh, the divisor. Now, uh, to solve for t0, we move t over. Keep in mind that t is being added. Uh, and, and the subtraction sticks with t0. So we end up with negative t0 is equal to negative t plus d minus d0 over v. Okay, or we could write it down as negative t0. Again, depending on whether you want your, to write your division like this or whether you want to talk about a fraction of what follows. Now, one reason I wrote uh, t first with the negative sign is with an eye to what's coming up next, because next we will be getting rid of the negative. And to do that, you can actually multiply the equation throughout by negative 1. Uh, or you can say that you're uh, multiplying by negative 1, and so you divide the right side by negative 1. When you divide a multiple, multiple term uh, expression by negative 1, the sign of every term changes. Uh, so we end up with t0 is equal to t and then instead of adding the term that follows we subtract it okay now we come to the next uh, stage where we want to talk about uh, how to deal with exponents uh, roots and logarithms uh, so again, we insist that the unknown should appear only once throughout the formula, but we're going to expand the operation set to include exponents, roots, and logarithms in addition to uh, uh, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. And for these problems, uh, we repeat the following steps until done. Uh, solve for the term that contains the unknown, solve for the factor that contains the unknown, keep repeating steps one and two, and then if your variable of interest is part of a base, so you, you're dealing with exponents, and the unknown is a base, we use roots. And uh, if it so happens that the variable of interest is an exponent, uh, we use logarithms. Okay, let's talk about these before we take a uh, look at our examples. Uh, so you notice that uh, inverse operations, addition and subtraction, that if you have x plus 2 is equal to 8, you can turn it into x is equal to 8 minus 2. And uh, the top row, uh, the top equation, corresponds to starting with x, then adding 2 to get 8. The second equation goes the other way. It says start with 8, then subtract 2, and you get x. So when we move an entity from one side of the equation to another side, uh, it really becomes its inverse for that reason. Uh, and uh, if you start with, uh, with minus, of course, uh, then its inverse is, is plus. So if you start with x and then subtract 4 and you get 9, you can start with 9 and add 4 to get x. And you can see how uh, one operation becomes its inverse on the other side. Same for multiplication. Uh, if you multiply by 3 to get 6, then you have to divide 6 by 3 to get what you started with. And same thing if you divide by a number to begin with. If you divide x by 5 to get 2, then uh, you can uh, multiply 2 by 5 to get uh, your x back. Now, just as we have these inverse operations, uh, for exponents, we have the same thing. If x goes to the power of 3 and you get 8, then to do the inverse, we use roots. So that's the notation that we have agreed uh, to, to represent the opposite of an exponent. Uh, you start with 8, take its cube root, and you go back to your x. Now you notice that in this case, uh, the unknown is part of a base. And if it's, if it's a base that's unknown, so here number 4, if the variable is, uh, is part of a base, then you use roots as inverse operations. Uh, but if, uh, if the unknown is an exponent, then we use logarithms. So you notice that uh, a problem that has a missing base is different from a problem that has a missing exponent. And that's why we need two different uh, kinds of notations for the inverse operation. Uh, you start with x, 
uh, as an exponent of 3 to get 9 and so you take 9 and you find uh, its log to the base 3 to find your x okay yeah we have a few more problems to go problem 24 uh, solve the following formula for s uh, a is equal to s to the power of 2 this is the area of a, a square with a side length of s. We switch sides. Now you notice that s is um, a part of a base, and so we will be using roots. s becomes equal to... Now for even exponents, uh, there are usually two possible answers. So if, uh, if, let's say, I square the number and I got 9, it could be positive 3 or negative 3. And so we put down positive or negative, and then root a. Although, from the point of view of physics, uh, a negative value for certain quantities may not make sense. Length is by definition, by agreement, positive. And so we drop the negative here, and we put down root a. Problem 25. Volume of a cube. Uh, v is equal to 4 thirds pi r cubed, and we solve for r. We put down 4 thirds pi r cubed is, is equal to v, and r cubed, now uh, the term that contains the unknown has been solved for. There are four factors, uh, counting 4 and 3 separate, uh, 4, 3 pi, and r to the power of 3. To solve for the factor that contains the unknown, that's r to the power of 3, uh, on the right side, we multiply v by 3, so division by 3 here became multiplication on the right side. And then uh, we put down 4 pi. Both 4 and pi are on top. They are being multiplied by. And they move down and they divide. Uh, or we can write it down as 3 quarters of v over pi. Now r itself becomes the third root of 3v over 4 pi. In this case, you don't need positive or negative. Uh, because for for odd root, uh, exponents there is only one possibility uh, if it if if the exponent is even you'll always get positive or negative but if it's odd you only get uh, the the simple root of it so r becomes the third root of three quarters of the over pi okay and uh, <clears throat> now we have solved the following formula for n now you notice that this time n is an is part of an exponent so as soon as you see that, you should know that logarithms are coming up. Okay, we switch sides. Or in this case, actually, we turn division by 2 to the power of n to multiplication on the left side, and then m moves down. And now n, which is part of a missing exponent, becomes log to the base 2, this 2 comes from here, of m0 over n. Problem 27, pn is equal to 1 plus r to the power of n times p0. Uh, this kind of formula is used so frequently in so many different contexts when a population, for example, or money or something like them, uh, either grows or, uh, or diminishes. Uh, and in this case, we want to solve for r. This is part of a base. We should expect that roots are coming up. Okay, let's switch sides. And then uh, we solve for the term that contains the unknown. Uh, there is only one term on the left side, so we don't have to take step number one. It has two factors. The bracket to the power of n is factor number one, and p0 is factor number two. We solve for the factor that contains the unknown. And that means multiplication by p0 on the left becomes division by p0 on the right side. Now we need to solve for uh, r, which is part of a base. And for that, we need roots. So 1 plus r becomes equal to the nth root of pn over p0. Now all we have to do is move 1 over r becomes equal to the nth root of pn over p0 minus 1. And I believe the last problem for today, uh, same equation, but now we want to solve for n. 
and because that's part of an exponent we should know that logarithms are coming up uh, switch sides and then again solve for the factor that contains the unknown up until here it's the same as before now if you were going to solve for r like the previous problem you would be using roots solving for n though we use logarithms base is 1 plus r and we take the log of pn over p0 okay everyone thank you so much for uh, taking the time to watch this video in the next video i will give you a few practice problems uh, and uh, and then uh, following that we talk about relationships between two quantities take care everyone